and said, I culture insect meat. So instead of making beef from cows and pork from pigs, I make bug meat. And I promise this isn't because we ran out of other animals to culture. Um, I'm not just trying to be novel and cool. There's actually some really compelling reasons to do this that I'll get into later. So entomal culture. This is a word I made up a few days ago. Um, <laughs> so cultured bug meat doesn't sound very appealing. Um, and it's hard to say. It doesn't roll off the tongue. Um, entomal culture comes from the Greek word for insect, which is entomon. Um, entomophagy is what we call the practice of eating edible insects. And then culture, of course, is what we do, it's how we make them, kind of combined entomophagy with labriculture. So um, this concept is obviously the combination of two different future food trends, the first being cultured meat and the second being edible insects. So first I'm going to try to convince you that eating insects is really cool. So entomophagy is practiced all around the world, just not really in America or countries with more westernized diets. But it really makes a lot of sense. Um, insects are accessible, they're really easy to raise um, in different communities around the world because you can just grow them in the backyard, you know, pick them off the plants that are already growing in your garden. They're really rich in different nutrients, um, specifically protein, fiber, healthy fats. And they taste pretty good. Um, <laughs> the, the question I get from everyone all the time is what do insects taste like? And yes, I have eaten insects, uh, slightly against my will, but it happened. Um, I've eaten mealworms, crickets, uh, lemon ants, and I once took a very tiny bite out of a scorpion. So the, the non-exciting answer to what they taste like is that it just depends. Um, insects tend to soak up the flavors in their environment. So it depends on how old they are, um, where they were raised, and mainly what you fed them. The fun answer is that crickets taste like nutty shrimp, and bee larvae taste like bacon mixed with chanterelle mushrooms. Scorpions apparently taste like fishy beef jerky. Maybe not so appealing on that one. Tarantula legs taste like chicken wings. Uh, my advisor, David Kaplan, uh, he's eaten silkworms pretty frequently, and he tells me that these taste like fried eggs. And my favorite description um, up on the right-hand side is a giant water beetle. And these apparently taste like melon that's been marinated in a banana rose brine with the consistency of red snapper. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. Um, so if eating insects is so cool and nutritious and sustainable, why are we going through the pain of culturing their cells? Well, as we all know, there's a lot of benefits to culturing cells, and these can also be applicable to edible insects. So insect farming right now is pretty humane. Um, at least on small scale, you kind of raise the insects um, in small containers or whatever that they can kind of have a lot of space, they're happy, um, and then when they're killed for food, you freeze them and they basically go to sleep. But as we know, as we scale up any sort of animal agriculture, um, it ends up not being so great for the animal. So culturing insect cells could be a humane way to get um, insect tissue. Um, and another reason is that it could perhaps be safer. Insects sometimes produce toxins through different tissues. People who are allergic to shellfish are also typically allergic to insects um, because of the exoskeleton, so we could make a safer food product. But the most compelling reason to do this is because edible insects is a great source of nutrition, but it's not really replacing the experience of eating meat. Um, if you're craving a burger or a steak, you don't think about eating cricket flour, right? Um, but, and this is because insects are tiny, um, they're kind of crunchy, they have a lot of extra little bits like wings and eyes and legs that, you know, I'm not too keen to put in my mouth. So by using cultured meat technology, we can target specific tissues so we can just grow muscle and just grow fat and end up getting something that looks more like a steak. It's just 
bug drive instead of cow drive. So how do we do this? Um, just like we grow beef, um, taking muscle cells from cows and fat cells from cows and growing those up, we can just take cells from insects instead. So insects don't have skeletons, so they don't really have skeletal muscle, but they do have muscles in their bodies that help them crawl and actuate their wings. And these muscles are pretty similar to vertebrate muscle in that they're aligned, they're striated, um, multinucleated. They're just a lot smaller in many cases. Um, and we can already do this. In the past, people have cultured caterpillar, cricket, and fruit fly muscles um, for different applications, just interest in muscle development or um, soft robotics. Some groups, um, my co-advisor has a soft robotics group and they're trying to grow insect muscle in vitro for the purpose of making little bio box since the muscle can contract in vitro. And then instead of taking adipose tissue, which vertebrates have, we can culture um, the analogy in insects, which is fat body tissue. So the fat body in insects is its own organ, and it's kind of uh, a mixture of vertebrate, adipose, and liver tissue because it can store and metabolize um, nutrients and energy. And this fat body tissue is where all those yummy lipids are, it's where the essential fatty acids are. And just like the muscle cells, cockroach, moth, and worm fat body cells have already been cultured in vitro mainly just for looking at how they synthesize um, different compounds. And then to get the um, connective tissue structure, so insects do have small amounts of extracellular proteins like collagen and laminin, but primarily um, the muscle just attaches directly to the cuticle, which is another word for the exoskeleton, and this is composed of chitin and different proteins, mainly chitin, um, and chitin is, can be um, trans, uh, uh, made into chitosin pretty easily. And chitosin is already a really common biomaterial used in tissue engineering for other applications. So we already know how to work with it. Um, it's very biocompatible. And although it comes from insect exoskeletons and also seafood waste um, from crabs and lobsters, it's also found in mushrooms. So we can have a sustainable source of this material to work with that's also relevant to insects and has already been well characterized for tissue engineering. So insects or cu cultured insects have some benefits over edible insects, <coughs> but um, entomal culture also has some benefits over culturing mammalian muscle. As most of us know, the main challenge with cultured meat is that it's hard to scale and it's really costly right now. And that's because mammalian cells are costly to grow. Insect cells are a little different and it could make a platform that's more scalable and more cost effective just through innate properties that insect cells have. So we talk about media a lot. Um, insect cells, unlike mammalian cells, are pretty easily adapted to serum-free media and they don't require recombinant growth factors. You can make an in-house formulation um, just with some simple basal media, a protein hydrolysate, and some lipids, and most insect cell lines are happy to grow in that. They have different metabolism pathways, so they don't produce as many toxic byproducts, which could inhibit their growth. And another cool thing is that they're very tolerant to fluctuations in their um, external environment. So you can literally culture them at room temperature and they will grow. You don't need an incubator. Um, it's best if they're kind of in a stable temperature, but they can do without. They can also transition between suspension and adherent culture. So you could grow them up in the proliferation phase and suspension and then seed them down as adherent when you're ready to differentiate them. Not only do they need more or can survive on more simple media formulations than mammalian cells, but they can also uh, survive longer on less media. We cultured mouse muscle cells, C2C12s, in parallel with some fruit fly muscle cells over 30 days. And usually what we do is we feed our cells every other day. In this experiment, we decided to starve them for a month uh, to see what happened. And as you can expect, like mammalian cells, they really, they really need food constantly. So they grew for a little bit. And then at the end of 25 days, 
they were all dead, detached from the cell culture plastic. Um, in comparison, fruit, the fruit fly cells just continued to grow and grow and grow, even on a single aliquot of media. Um, and even when they detached from the plate, they were just kept growing in suspension and were very viable. So here's some more details of what I've done so far in the lab. We have cultured both caterpillar muscle and fruit fly muscle. Um, the caterpillar cells is a primary line and the fruit fly cells is a continuous genetically immortalized line, um, a line that a lab at Harvard uh, established that also was engineered to express GFP, which is great for imaging. Um, and so we can culture these cells in vitro and then supply them with this hormone that naturally occurs in insects when they go through metamorphosis, which induces the cells to differentiate. We've also adapted our cells to uh, serum-free media. If you just slowly transition them from your initial culture supplemented with 10% FBS to this off-the-shelf serum-free media called XL405, um, it takes them about two weeks to adapt and then another month in culture in 100% serum-free, and then they exhibit similar growth rates to serum-supplemented culture. We've also been able to adapt them from adherent culture to shaker flask suspension culture. Um, again, it takes a couple weeks, but eventually they'll be happy growing in suspension, and you can supplement the cultures with dextran sulfate to reduce cellular aggregation and promote um, a single cell suspension culture. We did some preliminary work at just looking at their baseline nutrition properties in comparison with C2, C12s. So we looked at protein, iron, and zinc. Um, and insect cells, just like insects, are more dense in protein and minerals compared to the mammalian cell line we looked at. We also wanted to see if we could just, through a simple method, method boost the nutritional content of our cells. So we fed them in iron fortified media and we were able to double their iron content. We also wanted to transition the culture from 2D into something a little more interesting. So that mushroom chitosin I talked about, we made um, porous sponges with aligned microtubular pores, um, which is that SEM cube. And this was our scaffold that we used for 3D culture. So we seeded our fruit fly muscle cells within these scaffolds, and they did a whole lot better than I thought. They were completely happy proliferating on this scaffold. They took up almost every area that we gave them to grow on, forming nice confluent layers. Um, in some instances, we saw that they were aligned in the direction of the pores. And this is a great material because they're really happy on it, and you can also change the concentration of chitosin to get different mechanical properties. Um, to influence the texture of the end product. In conclusion, um, I, hope, I hope this inspired people to think a little bit more outside the box when it comes to cultured meat technology. Instead of just replicating the exact products that we already see on supermarket shelves, um, we could think outside the box a little bit and using this technology, what else can we create that's new and perhaps better than what we already have? Insect cells have some unique properties that could make, just by switching our target cell type, cultured meat production more scalable and affordable. Um, what I'm looking at next in future research is adding some fat cells to the muscle cell culture to get those lipids in there, um, increasing the differentiation efficiency of the cells, and taking a deeper look at nutrition. I want to acknowledge all the people that um, have supported me and my research along the way, David Kaplan, my advisor, um, Isha Dattar wouldn't be here without her and New Harvest. And thanks also to the research fellows, our summer undergraduate students, and uh, my fellow graduate students at Tufts, as well as all my collaborators. Thank you. I'm, I'm ready to eat some tarantula legs. Um, very exciting um, and very exciting term that uh, uh, intimaculture. I didn't realize. I was like, oh man, why have I never heard of that? And it's because you came yeah. up. With it. Um, so one of the uh, there's a lot of questions in here about this, but one of the themes is you know people are asking, does it make sense from a financial and energy perspective, or if insects are usually consumed whole, then how do we compete with 
farming whole insects and convincing people to just eat insects versus culturing them to resemble things, products that we're more familiar with. Um, like why is culturing preferable to eating insects? Yeah. I guess I'd say because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it doesn't give the same experience as eating meat. We're, I'm not trying to uh, create an alternative for eating insects. We're still on the same goals of making meat to combat all those environmental um, animal welfare challenges that we have with livestock meat. Um, this work was inspired through how can we get those products in a different way. So this isn't um, an alternative to edible insects because the products will look more like steak or chicken because that's what people want. We're not trying to um, convince people to eat insects and then say that culturing them is a better method. Um, I think we need to pursue a bunch of alternatives. So this is an interesting question. Why is it insect cells don't need FBS? And I guess my follow-up question is, what, what are the nutrients that they do need? Yeah, um, so it's kind of interesting that you can grow insect cells in FBS at all, since it's, you know, why do insects need cow blood? They don't interact with cows ever. <laughs> uh, but, at, but they do grow in FBS, which is cool. Um, but yes, they don't need it. And we don't really know why. Just like we don't really know why FBS works, what things in there are working, um, it's, it's a really challenging problem that people haven't really been incentivized to look into before. Um, it kind of just like, it works. They can do it. Um, we don't really need to know why. Um, kind of until this point, now it would be great to know exactly what they need to make it more efficient. So um, they just survive on basal media, um, one of the popular ones is Schneider's or L15 or Grace's insect media, which is just vitamins, minerals, amino acids. Um, and then they would always need like a protein hydrolysate, which can either be animal based, but they also survive um, well on soy based hydrolysates. And then they need some lipids, um, they can't synthesize their own cholesterol, so we supplement them with cholesterol. And kind of the difference between insect cells and mammalian cell basal media is they need a much higher um, supply of amino acids than mammalian cells need. Um, might be thinking a little bit further ahead for this, but when, when do you think it would be possible to commercialize something like this? I know a lot of the cultured meat products are saying they'll be on you know, shelves by 2020, et cetera, so for something like a cultured caterpillar steak. Right. <laughs> Uh, it's a complex question. I mean, I can see the path there, um, but right now I'm the only person that I know working on this, so I can't do it alone. I hope other people see this as something valuable and want to join the team or work on this um, in parallel. And you know, the more money we get, the more interested people we get, the faster it'll happen. That's pretty cool. Um, and then another interesting question is, how do you transfer this culture method to marine arthropod cells? Yeah, um, I, think, I think what we learn from insect tissue engineering will translate very well to crustaceans. Um, just because looking in the past, people have had success, uh, limited success growing crustacean cells, but when they have had success, it's largely inspired by what has happened in insect cell culture. So um, more so than mammalian techniques being translated to crustacean culture, it seems like um, things that work better for insects also work well for crustacean cells. Um, but there are very few crustacean um, projects in the works, at least in the past. It doesn't seem like anyone's been able to establish a cell line from crustaceans at all. So there's something that's missing um, even between insect and crustacean that people haven't figured out yet. All right, Natalie, thank you so much. Thank you.